Hey everyone, and welcome back to the Build series. I'm your host, Jaina Jefferson. Jazz bassist, singer, composer, and poet Esperanza Spalding has delighted audiences since exploding onto the scene in the mid 2000s. And through it all, she's continued to evolve and break down our perceptions of genre with everything she's touched thus far, which is especially evident by her seventh album, 12 Little Spells. Not only is she a Grammy Award winning artist, she's also a professor of the practice of music at Harvard University, and we're so thrilled to have her. So everyone, please welcome Esperanza Spalding. Hey, how are you today? Feeling pretty good? Yeah. Before we start, I just want to say happy early birthday. I know you got a birthday coming up. I do, I do, I do. It's so a happy do, early birthday. Are you Thank doing anything you. to celebrate? I'm going to have a jam session next door to Cornell West's house. That Now that is a party. We that invited party. him, but he he's not available. Dang. But So we're just going to have it next door. Where? You know, <laughs> as long as it's in the proximity, that's totally fine. It just worked out that way. So, yeah, that's <laughs> what we're going to do. So um, I know you grew up in Portland. Mm -hmm. um, so how has that upbringing, knowing that there's so many sounds and styles that come mm -hmm. from Portland, how has mm -hmm. that shaped the way that you've approached your music? Ooh. Well, I always thought it was my right that I was entitled to have access to music education. And I think that has a big impact on the way that I approach just being in the world. Mm -hmm. um, because there was so much programming available for me, I just always felt like, yeah, whatever I decide to do, like I have a right to do that and I'll find the support. That's like hardwired in my psyche because of how I grew up. I wasn't as in touch with the genres, mm -hmm. but um, just the idea that if you get struck by an inspiration to do some music, you're gonna find people to support that. And that's a that's a state that has carried me far, I think. Yeah, definitely. Mm. And going with that, you know, genreless perception, um, most projects that you've done, you've kind of distanced yourself from just being a jazz musician. You are the woman who just does what she wants. Well, I should clarify that too, because I'm in like a deep reckoning right now with mm -hmm. jazz as a spirit and as um philosophy pedagogy practice. I as a bassist mm -hmm. with other people's project, I can play some jazz bass. But I'm really humbled right now um, before this the immensity of this music that I love so much. And I feel like I had to remove the signifier of being a jazz musician. Cause yeah. I'm, I don't really, I'm not really a jazz musician, I confess. Um, <laughs> but I love the music and the craft so much. And because of that, I out of honor for what it is to really be in that in that hustle and that devotion. Mm -hmm. I don't want to name myself a jazz musician. I don't know what kind of musician I am, but <laughs> it's not that. But when, you know, I play with Joe Lovano or or Jack DeJohnette or Leo Genovese or these mm -hmm. these individuals who are like deep in it. I can be a support mechanism as Absolutely. a bass player. Mm -hmm. But beyond that, I feel like I feel like because otherwise the jazz gods are gonna like strike me with lightning or something. <laughs> Everybody keeps calling me a jazz musician. I'm like, stop, hold on. <laughs> and I used to claim it too because mm -hmm. I was uh, naive. I was like young and ignorant. I'm still young and ignorant, but um, <laughs> at least I've got that piece now. Yeah, and with like you know a lot of albums that you've done, really, um, Radio Music Society had a yeah. lot of different sounds. Um, Emily's D Plus Revolution, which I. Love. Oh, bless. Yeah. Um, that was funky. That was rock. Like, yeah. There were so many different sounds and styles that you have to offer. So I'm really glad that you're kind of distant. I'm just letting it go because it's, it was like hot for a minute. And I think I'm like a, I was, am, could be an anomaly, like in the realm of jazz. Mm -hmm. but lately, as I'm listening deeper and reading deeper, I'm like, uh oh, these brothers, I'm just imagining like Eric Dolphy or like Mal Waldron. Somewhere in the ethers looking looking down at me and going like, child, <laughs> that ain't it. <laughs> you know what I mean? But the, but the writing is like, yes, Burns building jazz. So I just want to set the record straight. Um, you heard it here. You heard it here first at Bills. But, um, you know, as a, a student, a light student of the music, I've always borrowed certain aesthetic truths, you know, mm -hmm. aesthetic tools um, to build to build um, the things that I make, you know? Mm -hmm. And I very much am connected with beings within that yes. deep, deep, deep practice. But it's such a devotion. I'm thinking of Jerry Allen, phenomenal musician, composer, scholar of the music, being asked, how come more young people don't get into jazz? You know, mm -hmm. like it's such a beautiful art form. It's like American art form. It's originated here. Absolutely. It's a voice of freedom, expression, et cetera. She was like, because it's hard. <laughs> <laughs> And it is. 
Well, speaking of spirituality and Ooh. being connected, Ooh, yeah. 12 Little Spells hey. has a lot of hey. spirituality and a lot of that essence. So what inspired you to create a project that would allow listeners to feel it from their head to their toes mm. to their innermost being? Ooh, ooh. It's a, it's a sp- Wayne Chota says, you write what you wish for. Mm-hmm. And I'm thinking of Adrian Marie Brown talking about how all activism is speculative fiction. Ooh. Actually, I think she's um, quoting Walida, who, who said that. But um, this is my speculative fiction. I'm not a trained music therapist. Mm-hmm. I haven't yet taken that plunge into really studying um, how what aspects of music can be harnessed in a therapeutic context to affect our neurological system, our healing, our, our capacity as human beings to transform our experience of reality Mm -hmm. um but i think as artists we are doing that always intuitively like we we are always kind of like looking for that thing that's going to get that specific emotion out of the listener so this is my non-scientific offering as a, a practitioner in the healing arts and saying i want to be able to support your healing through my sound from your head to your toe gotcha and from Reiki, I'm borrowing this understanding that much of what ails us in specific body parts mm-hmm. is emblematic of a deeper spiritual, psychological, emotional um, rupture or misalignment. So the idea that you could go through each part of your body and sort of calibrate that yeah. body part, it would work through to your subconscious to affect that, that part of your psyche or spirit or heart that is expressing through that body part. Um, also... It's just really good music. It's just, and it was. Have you all listened to this? My goodness. You should. Excellent. Excellent. I worked really stuff. hard on it. Now, I know that um, 12. Hey. There's a really big meaning behind 12. Mm. I feel like there's hella layers to 12. Mm. There was 12 songs before the um, deluxe album, the mm-hmm. deluxe version came out. Uh, you were in the studio for about 12 days or so. Mm-hmm. Days. So give us a little rundown of why 12 is so important to this particular project. It's going to take too long. Give us a a bridged version. Okay. Oh, my gosh. I mm, I got you. I know. You got me. (laughs) You got me. I I can write to you about it later. It's it's magical. 12 is a a magic number. I don't know if you knew that. Um, But, yeah, I don't feel like going into it right now. It is okay. Because I just, (laughs) yeah. It's cooking. Even I I started studying with this... um, Ah, this is going to sound very woo-woo, but I started studying with this healer woman, shamanistic practice path woman in Los Angeles. And before we started working with each other, I was asking her about which color my next jump shoot, jump shoot suit should be. <laughs> We're talking about blue and all this stuff. And she was like, I don't know what it is, but I'm just feeling like 12. I, I want to I wanna like pull you into the consciousness of 12. And I was like, lady... Too late. I'm already pulled into the consciousness of 12. <laughs> um, but yeah, there there is a, a charge to that number emanating out from it. Again, like I'm hesitant. I'm hesitant to speak about it because I'm still in yes, study of I it. Totally understand. And I like out of respect for the for the fellows and individuals who are like deep in the study of the the potency and vibrancy of what different numbers offer. Um, it it is magical. Mm-hmm. And twelve little spells. And now it's 16 little spells because of the bonus mm-hmm. songs, but 12 sounds better. Rolls off the tongue. It does. <laughs> so 12 Little Spells is also your third album in three years. Is that true? Yes, girl. That's why I'm tired. <laughs> I get it. Okay. Um, there were so many different genres and styles coming out of these albums. So how, mm. do you have any idea what the next album or project may sound like? Ooh. Ooh. Well, first I, had to, first I get the luxuriant privilege the immense privilege of finish finishing this opera that i've been working on um i'm i'm going to let that life fully emerge the life of the opera and then think about what the hell i'm gonna do next i i feel like there's more life in 12 little spells to be discovered like in the live space so that will probably happen first but um right now all of my creative juices are dedicated to um 
fully forging this opera that I've been working on with Wayne Shorter. Well, it's his opera that mm. I'm I'm supporting in a doula role, sort of, and also as the librettist. What an incredible life! Yeah, it's very magical, and and like the themes in the opera are leaping out of the page and actually becoming like the. Um, the symbol of what we're living in the process of making the opera, it's, mm-hmm. it's really been an adventure. Yeah, so keep your eyes peeled. Wayne Shorter's opera, but Iphigenia. I am ready. Coming at you. So before, um, before all of this, mm-hmm. in the midst of all of this, mm-hmm. you're also a professor at Harvard University. The word professor, I'm not professing anything. Mm-hmm. I'm not professing to know or be the expert of or master of anything. But I am in deep study with my students. I am using it as um, a container to explore some themes and some modes of inquiry that I'm really interested in, like how music can serve um, the goals of community organizing, um, how we as musicians can show up in community and offer the potency of of our gifts in support of work that's already being done around social justice Mm -hmm. or policy transformation or mental health um, awareness, so many different ways that it can show up. Um, And then I have the privilege of working with these young songwriters, student songwriters, and again, just holding space and sharing what I know, Mm -hmm. what I can hear and see that maybe they're not hearing and seeing. so the word professor like doesn't sit right on my shoulder, okay. but um, it is it is definitely a co co learning co exploring space. Um, a wise Didi once said, "The children are our future. Teach them well, let them lead the way." But they can also <laughs> teach you something as well. Oh please! What are some of the things that you've learned from your students? Oh, that um, I'm not using the internet right. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, yeah. The the I mean these are these are like the brightest and the most some of the brightest and the most brilliant in the way that they've been pursuing their brilliance and brightness, right? Um, as academics. So I'm always floored by how they use the World Wide Web um to research. Like the mm-hmm. smallest seed of an idea, you know? It'll be like, oh, um, how can imagery in song activate the senses? Just as a specific example, something we were talking about in our songwriting class, Mm -hmm. I was encouraging them to use language that would invite the listener into a sensory experience instead of Mm -hmm. talking about the thing. Like, can you forge that object with your language? Meanwhile, over the course of a week, they went off and found all this literature and all of these interviews from creators, from singers talking about the potency, the power of imagery and song and what... (sighs) They're brilliant. They're just beautifully brilliant and great songwriters. And um, so I'm also learning a lot about just vulnerability and generosity, Mm -hmm. you know, for students who've invested so much energy in being exact and showing up like done and prepared. I'm asking them to to just be unfinished Mm -hmm. and, and try and show us what you got and we'll work on it from there. And they're so they're so generous with that. So I'm also learning a lot of humility and, and courage from witnessing how they, they're willing to show up in this experiment space, which is our course, you know, on mm-hmm. both fronts, on songwriting and on music activism. Um, yeah. Yeah, and just they're, they're <laughs> it's kind of boring, but the prep, like you can't get away with nothing in front of these young people. They are always watching. Look, so I'm, I'm like, ooh, let me... <laughs> Let me read a couple more articles about this before I come in on Monday. You know, it's really it's a check on my toes. I feel my even <laughs> if it's not a verbal check, it'd be like a hmm. The squint. Oh, I'm you know like, the squint. <laughs> yeah. And I and I love that. I really I do love that. It's a nice balance to the um intuitive modality that I've been in for most of my life mm-hmm. of the way that I create things, you know. So last quick question before oh. we get to audience questions. Um the album's all about music's interaction with the body and how mm-hmm. it helps us to heal. Mm-hmm. How has music helped you heal during times where you needed it most? Mm-hmm. I just learned um, a couple weeks ago that um, my brain is on fire. It is, I mean, not <laughs> not clinically, but a neuroscientist who works with improvisation in the brain showed me these scans of my brain that we did in, in Oakland. 
And before I was improvising, it was like so overactive. Like almost the whole thing was like bright red, just engaged. Just the language centers and the the personal narrative centers, everything was just like <sighs> And then he shook my brain while I was actively improvising. And it was cool. It was literally, I mean, they just chose these colors arbitrarily to show you where the activity is. But when there's less blood flowing to the regions of the brain, it shows up as blue. So he's essentially showing me that when I'm improvising, my brain is being soothed, literally. It's, de it's, it's, um, it's almost like deactivating the overactive elements. Mm -hmm. So from that, I took away like, wow, for those of us who are in the improvisational arts, at least in music, we, are, we have this tool within our voice, within our body, that's literally soothing us from the inside out. Uh, and that's very profound and powerful. And Absolutely. I, oh, in that awareness now, I find myself, if I'm getting nervous or too amped up about something, I'll just like start to improvise and immediately just feel it. you back yeah. to calm. So I offer that to you as well. Anybody who has like a musical practice, that's a, that's a resource that you have in your voice and in your body. Um, and it's beautiful. It's powerful. Awesome. We have time for two audience questions. Okay. Hello. Hi. Um, I've been following you for years and love your music. And I've always wanted to ask, speaking of musical education, have you, um, were you or follow or influenced at all by uh, Jaco Pastorius? Yes, influenced. I mean, I can't do the stuff he did. <laughs> I wish I could. But I definitely studied him as a bassist, for sure. Yeah, I went through some deep, deep exploration periods. And then had to back away because I don't want to just be biting somebody else's sound, but absolutely, he's a big inspiration, for sure. All right, next question. Hi, Esperanza. Hi. I've had the pleasure of seeing you in many different venues, Prospect Park, Jazz Standard, the Apollo, Radio City Music. Wow, thanks. I thanks mean, uh, coming out. society. Um, what are some of your favorite venues to perform in? Whoa. Oh, where there are people. <laughs> I mean, really, it's like, well, you've been at Carnegie Hall, so I mean, like, acu yeah. acoustically, are some places better for you? Is the sound better? Is the, the warmth of the room better? I mean, I really besides don't the process audience? it that way. Yeah. To me, it's mm -hmm. like the fact that we are sharing space together to exchange sound is the miracle. Mm -hmm. That's, that is such a miracle and such a blessing that human beings out with all their busyness decided to sit down and pay some money to experience my sound. So really, like, the... Some venues have better sound systems and this and that and this, but essentially, you know, my focus is on figuring out how to work through whatever medium is amplifying the sound it, to just have that exchange in the moment when we have it. Honestly, I mean, it, like if I'm thinking about the quality of the sound in the venue, to me, I'm not in the place I need to be to, to do my, my work. And sometimes the challenge of like a crappy sound system <laughs> actually is like a catalyst for a different kind of communication where you, you can't depend on that like, you know, beauty of sound or excellence of venue. And I, I'm interested about that space too, about what comes through when you, when you have to sing through the challenges of a venue um, or connect through the challenges of a venue. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, and also like living rooms. I'm often the person at a party who's like, let's have a jam. Like, just bang on the table. It's okay if you don't play music. Like, let's just go. Let's make sound. And sometimes those are the most beautiful performances, just where human beings that might not identify as performers or musicians are willing to engage in the exchange of sound, you know. I think you answered that pretty well. Yeah. Wow. Awesome. Well, thank mm. you guys for asking those great questions. Uh, Esperanza, thank you so much for being here. Yeah, you are just you. a beautiful ray time. of light. Oh, my. Um, <laughs> for real. Okay. Libra queen. Wow. <laughs> I'll take that part. Yeah. Awesome. So those who are paying attention at home, please don't leave. Please oh. stay tuned in because Esperanza is going to be back That's performing right. a new song. Well, not a new song, but she is going it's to be a performing spell, a song. Though. I have it's a spell from you. Awesome. So stay tuned. <laughs> 